see, you're missing something. You own, you own part of America. You own the public airways. It's just simple. And that's what you could learn after school. You learn a menu of understanding power. Because if, if you're educated and you don't understand power, you're not being educated. Because politics, democracy is all about who has power, who doesn't, and who should. And who shouldn't. That's what it's all about. The very idea that they focus people of goodwill on charity, and yet they don't understand the difference that a society that has more justice needs less charity. You don't need soup kitchens if people have employment. And they need some work. So we need to really simplify the profound. To simplify the profound and do our bit in, in the community. Of your community, it is a global economy, and they will come knocking, you know, and so you cannot live without the alliances that are national and international, that is for sure. Yeah, we need a civic globalization. We have a corporate globalization now. And some of us are, you know, in, in Washington, D.C., and do national work, and some of us are, you know, in our communities and working to, to encourage, you know, all the national communities, but we, there has to be someone at every, in every front, and we have to work together. Well, a lot, a lot of young people have come up to me after they hear a session like this, and they say, it's really good that you said all this, but I'm not turned on to politics. And I say, well, you better look at history, because if you don't turn on to politics, politics turns on you. Okay? So it isn't a luxury. We invest our authority in delegated representatives who are our government, right? We're the sovereign, we the people. We give them the votes. We give them the legitimacy to use force or to advance justice. And it's taken away from us by the corporate state, basically the corporations, know that they have to control government because government is the principal force that can discipline them. They can regulate them. They can prosecute them. They can reshape them. They can put them out of business if they're recidivist criminals. So why is it even an issue? They, are, they have taken government away from us, turned it against us, and the, re the immature reaction is, oh, the government can't be trusted, and therefore I don't want to have anything to do with government. You can't escape it. Either you control it or it controls you on behalf of Wall Street. Resistance, to me, is more about engagement. It's at what point do you decide, this is really important to my community, this is really important to, to me and how I want to see the future um, unfold. We make choices every day. We vote every day a thousand times. So choose which farmer to buy something from. And that sends a message. It's, it's resistance, it's another way of looking at resistance. Resistance happens at multiple levels of participation. And there are people that have, have it within their genes to be on that front line. And there are a lot of people that don't, that still there are a lot of ways to participate in resistance. The beauty of local resistance is that it is people from the community, from all walks of life, from all ages. It's the volunteer work. It's the way we treat each other. It's the way we love each other and care for each other. It sees you through. And I cannot tell you how many wins that I've seen after. I thought it was going to be, uh, you know, we were going to lose. I uh, worked very closely with the group Save Our Groundwater SOG in, New in Barrington, New Hampshire. They fought a, a water, it was a, would have been a bottled water company, but it was near an um, a environmental reserve and also sitting on a, a, a toxic site that was not to be developed. Uh, but it didn't matter to the local authorities who gave it to them anyway. And they, I think it was like 12 years or something. Um, and they're gone. The company's gone. The land's been, re been returned. I mean, there are these wonderful stories when you resist and you stay with your resistance and you don't give in. They don't have all the money in the world. You think they do, but they don't. And they don't have all of the legal, you know, if you get onto the other side, often they're hurting not like we are. They don't have anything, but we have people power. But they don't have the power we think they do. These are dinosaurs. The Hudson Valley Smart Energy Coalition and what we're dealing with the transmission lines. There are many people, there's a group of us, about 30 of us, that non-stop engagement, meetings every week, you know, reading all the legal briefs. And then there's a group of people that show up at the, the, the various town meetings. And there's a group of people that have signed a petition. 
and then there's going to be 400 of you that are going to call the governor. There are laws made by nation states and municipalities, and one would do well to fashion your society in accordance with the Creator's law. The second is the teaching of Indinue Maganatuk, which is we are all related. Whether we have wings or fins or roots or paws, we are all related. In fact, all of us in the room are 99.9% .9 related, right? So let us act as if we are relatives, in a functional way. <laughs> <laughs> let us treat the world as if we are all related and, look at, and, and undertake, undertake policy that is carried out in such a way. The third is the teaching of reciprocity. Reciprocity. No, that's what anthropologists call it. But you know what I know is, you know what I know, and I think that you all practice it. You know, you're all very enlightened bunch. But in my experience, you know, the fact is, is that, I mean, our practice is that when we go out to harvest, you know, when we go out, whether it is to harvest wild rice or maple syrup or medicines, we always give thanks. We're always grateful. In our case, we use a sema. We offer a sema. Sometimes we offer a song and we offer a prayer also of gratitude. When you're taking something, you do not take without giving gratitude. And on the other side of it is, is that it is always a good thing to have, you know, a Thanksgiving all the time. You know, I laugh and it's the Thanksgiving, you know, coming up here in a month or so. It is not something you have once a year because I am grateful each day when I, when I get up and I am alive and I'm, I'm healthy. And I live in this beautiful world that the Creator gave me. And so it is important, I think, to celebrate that Thanksgiving and to, we feast all of the great things given to us, you know, and we do that on a consistent basis. So to be, to, so to be grateful at all times. And the fourth premise is one which I already mentioned, the idea that in each deliberation you consider the impact upon the seventh generation from now. Without those components, you know, it is impossible for, you, for us to, to pretend that we are going to create a system with our, our, our way of life, our governance system, that will really care. It will really care. It will be really, in my assessment, rather meaningless. When our ancestors went into battle, they did not ask what the consequences were going to be. All they knew is that if they did nothing, things would not go well for their children. Do not operate out of a place of fear. Operate out of a place of hope. Because with hope, everything is possible. And then you must, and you must make regulations that make sense for our future generations. And finally, what it says here is do cool shit. Living machine thing, that is a cool thing. You know, do all the cool things. Because the fact is, is that, you know, as, as, as the Zapatistas will tell you, you've got to organize them in places where they are not. You know what I'm saying? Is that the more we strengthen and restore and build our local economies, our local networks, the stronger we are going to be as people. As, as, as nations, while well, we fight those guys, because you still got to eat. You still got to be able to feed, you know, yourselves. And they, and they store things, you know. In my tribe, that picture that you see at the end, you know, in that video is me putting a sturgeon in the river. My family and our tribe has restored the sturgeon to our territory. We did not, we did not restore the sturgeon so that a pipeline company could put a pipeline through there, you know. We did not restore the wild rice, so that could happen. And all of you who have been caring for your rivers, you did not take care of those rivers so that these companies could pollute it. You know? Do, the, do those good things. Have courage in doing those. I leave you with one quote. This guy's from Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. They're super cool guys. This one guy's like my nephew. I said, I see this quote in your annual report. Can I use this? He says, you know, I got to tell you where it comes from, Auntie. He says, he tells me about this ceremony. And he said, in the ceremony, so the spirit came, this so the spirit said. How long are you going to let others determine the future for your children? Are we not warriors? When our ancestors went into battle, they did not ask what the consequences were going to be. All they knew is that if they did nothing, things would not go well for their children. Do not operate out of a place of fear. Operate out of a place of hope. Because with hope, everything is possible. The time is now and the movement is here. That's what he said. So miigwech, thank you for your time. So my, my first practice is uh, every time I'm disturbed by an injustice or a violation, uh, I first think of what is the right thing to do mm -hmm. and find that path. 
and from that get the energy to resist. So when I found out about the GMOs and the patenting and the global free trade treaties, the GATT, and uh, realized they wanted to patent seed, I taught myself everything about seed saving and started doing it and all the consequences that come with it and all the responsibilities. Um, the second, you know, for me, it's a daily practice, the lessons from the Gita, which talk about engagement, that you have a duty to be engaged. But with that duty comes a detachment to the outcome of your actions, because you don't know. And a lot of burnout in activists happens because they're very attached to the outcome. And uh, part of my practice to, is to be passionate and yet be detached. And to work that balance out is an everyday meditation. <laughs> Margaret Mead once said on a stage like this, when someone stood up and said, Dr. Mead, you know, world famous anthropologist, can a few people do it? She says, to anyone who doubts whether a few people can make the difference, it's always been a few people. It's always been the small community. That's what it's all about. And once you realize that, you know, you're not as intimidated. You're not saying, oh, it's going to take millions of people. Not when the public opinion is behind you. One percent, I'm talking millions of people, for health and all the other things where people aren't represented in an organized way airline passengers, bus passengers, and, and so on. That's why I really emphasize again and again the importance of small communities, because they all start small, they elaborate the issue, they arouse a lot of people, they change the public sentiment, and then other forces can kick in. you got to understand about big corporations, and we're not talking small business. The thing we have to understand is enough is never enough. They're driven in their D D D DNA, ever more profit, ever more weapon systems, Lockheed Martin, ever more junk food, exploiting children for obesity and diabetes, ever more hooked people on tobacco. Enough is never enough. You cannot allow institutions in society who, has no, who have no sense of boundaries, who have no sense of civic value, who only are driven monomaniacally, they're like a monoculture, monomaniacally by the profit drive. Every major religion in the world for thousands of years has warned its adherents, don't give too much power to the mercantile class, the merchant class. Because when it collides against other far more important values, human rights, tolerance, safety, health, it, it doesn't stop. It has to roll right over or co-opt or diminish or shove aside or destroy. That's the nature of it. And that's why every advance in our country and any other country is when commercial values are subordinated to civic values. When we said no to slavery, we told the cotton plantations, you're not going to have slaves to make more profit. You're going to have to subordinate it to human rights. When we abolished child labor, we told the factories, no, these, these children should go to school, you hire their parents, you will not make profit off that. So we subordinated the commercial. Now what's the nature of the last generation in our country? Heavily tipped in subordinating civic values to commercial supremacy. That's what the trade agreements are all about. That's what deregulation is all about. That's what the grotesque you know, term tort reform is all about. That's what the phony assertion that we live in a free market society until, of course, the big companies need they need to be bailed out, all the rest of it. That's what it's all about. People say, that's not possible. I say, yes, it is. If you know anything about cultures, they have styles of violence that are relatively immune if they proceed from the power structure, in our case, the corporation. So watch this. 14,000 street homicides last year. We have a few hundred victims of what they call terrorism. And that, that almost blots out the entire news cycle. I mean, that's all serial killers and so forth. Now, now watch the preventable violence. The key thing is preventability, whether it's street crime or corporate crime. Watch the figures. 
65,000 Americans every year die from air pollution. Preventable, EPA figures. 60,000 Americans die from workplace-related diseases and trauma. Preventable, OSHA figures. 2,000 people die every week from hospital malpractice. Ha Harvard School Public Health figures. 40,000 people die every year in this country because they can't afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time. Harvard's medical school peer review study. Do we need to go on? There is 200 to 250 people who die from hospital-induced infections. They don't bring it. They get it in the hospital, according to the Centers for Disease Control. Do you see any of these massive epidemics of preventable violence part of any political campaigns? Democrat, Republican, primaries? It's never mentioned. Terrorism. Non-state terrorism, you see? Because that's big business, isn't it? Trillions of dollars going to the war on terrorism, right? Even though we have killed far more civilians overseas than the 9-11 killed in the U.S. You want to talk about a numbers game? How, how about... want so long, but the point is this. The point is they don't grow up confronting reality. We have to take the education of these children and give it to them extracurricularly in, 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 in communities all over the country, whether they're in clubs or whatever you want to do. Take it. Don't worry about the rules of the schools. They'll drive you nuts. Just get them 12 hours in terms of a of a lecture series to high school students on corporate supremacy over our lives, their lives. Open their eyes like nothing before. We all have, don't we all have our light bulb ex experience with a teacher, sixth grade, eighth grade? Wow, and we never forget it. It doesn't take many hours. 